Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning to all of you. Good to be together again in the house of the Lord and to open his word together. Guided by his spirit, we know that he speaks to us through his word and we anticipate with eagerness the words that he'll bring to us this morning. This summer, we've been going through the Psalms as we have done these last few years, looking at various Psalms guided by uh, the lectionary um, as we select them and reflect on them. And this morning, we turn to Psalm 84, and I'd like to invite you to read along with me, either in the Pew Bibles in front of you or as it is displayed on the screen, Psalm 84. This is the word of God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Thus far our reading. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a brief meditation written by John Bell, a member of the Iona community. The meditation is called Yearning. Imagine. Imagine you're seated at a desk, your desk, in your house. And in front of you are filing trays, some stacked on top of each other and some sitting on their own. Each tray looks well filled with paper, but you cannot see what the papers are about on, because on top of each tray is covered a piece of red card and written on each piece of red card in bold black ink is the word passion. Your curiosity is getting the better of you, so you look at the tray nearest your left hand and, and lift up the red card cover. And under it is a pile of advertisements for chocolate. And as soon as you see those pictures, your mouth waters, your nostrils flex, for chocolate is indeed one of your passions. You replace the red card and turn to the tray closest to your left, your right hand. And you lift the card on top of it. And underneath it, you see a pile of newspaper clippings about weapons and arms sales and landmines that injure children in Mozambique and dictators who squander national budgets on military hardware. And you feel angry because these injustices are something that you are passionate about and all the thoughts of chocolate are gone. You stretch out ahead of you for any random tray in front and lift the red card cover and under it are pictures, photographs 
of the people you love most and who love you and who know you and in whose company you delight. And you begin helplessly to reminisce about your fondness for them and all the thoughts of arms trade eradicates. Out of curiosity, out of sheer curiosity, you begin, so to speak, to lift the lid on all the other trays about you see, whether visual or in written form, all the things that you are passionate about. And only you can name what they are. Food, holidays, the things that money can buy. Laughter, physical intimacy, the things only friendship can bring. Good music, good books, the things of the intellect and the heart. Political issues, community issues, the things that distort or enhance the world. Only you, only you can name and recognize these passions as you lift cover after cover after cover and see what is alluded to below. And then you stop for a moment and feel a curious mixture of exhilaration and frustration. It's like being high and low at the same time. So many things that rouse emotion. So why are you never fulfilled? So many things to satisfy the desires. So why are you still hungry? So many diverse things to demand time and attention, commitment. How can you hold all of them in one life? And you feel both exhilaration and frustration at the same time. And then through an open window, you hear a child sing, a girl, no more than seven. She's singing a song that she learned in Sunday school, words that you remember well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. All these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first. Seek the Lord. Psalm 84 is a seeking psalm. A psalm of longing. A psalm of yearning. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. The poet is passionate for the courts of the Lord, for that place where, where God's people come together to meet with God, the living Lord Almighty. Very likely the psalmist has in mind the temple in Jerusalem. And as far as architectural beauty and magnificence goes, there were other places in the ancient world that were much more majestic but the poet writes, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. There is a deep longing, to use an older word, a pining, an earnest desiring and passion to go to the Lord's house. If it wasn't such an irreverent thing to do, I could imagine my father-in-law, who's now deceased about eight years ago. I could imagine my father-in-law rewriting parts of Psalm 84 in a way that might sound like this. How lovely is your serenity, O Balsam Point. Balsam Point, you need to know, was the name of the family cottage in the uh, interior of Ontario. One that he built and I helped him and a beautiful place where my father-in-law loved spending time. My soul yearns, I can imagine him writing, even fainting for your peacefulness and tranquility. My heart and flesh cry out for Balsam Point. 
Blessed are those who dwell among your trees. They're ever filled with calm. Better is one day in your surroundings than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather fish off the dock at Balsam Point than dwell in the finest resorts of the Mediterranean. And that's true. He would. <laughs> I could go on. I'm not trying to be irreverent, maybe a bit playful, but here's my point. The serenity, the, the peacefulness, the joy that my father-in-law experienced when he was at the cottage couldn't, couldn't be separated from actually being at the cottage. If you were to tell him, you know, Dad, just imagine Balsam Point. Just imagine what it's like. Imagine the trees and the lake. That would never work. The journey of, of going to the cottage, the yearning for the cottage, the great joy and peace that would come to him from being there couldn't be separated from actually being there. And that, it seems to me, is a very important piece of what this psalmist is saying in Psalm 84. The psalmist holds together, on one hand, a yearning for God, and holds that together with a yearning for a place. And it's a place that God has made, a place that he has chosen to manifest his presence. The psalmist is suggesting that, that faith and journey always go together. Another way of saying that is faith is more than just about knowing about God. Faith is moving towards God, seeking him, longing for his presence, desiring to worship him, to listen to him, to seek his face in prayer, and to honor him in the way that we live our lives. One of my former preaching professors, now a retired preacher in the Christian Reformed Church, Dr. Stan Mast, preached a sermon on Psalm 84, and he titled it, How to Find God Even in Church. The title was intentionally provocative because he recognized something that, that it would seem more and more people in our day actually feel. For many in our day, church seems to be the last place where they think they might find God. Maybe listening to a delightful piece of Chopin concerto or sonata, maybe being out in the open waters on a boat, canoeing your favorite lake, hiking your favorite mountain. There you might experience God, but at church? That's true, I think, for many. For others, perhaps they would say something like, I have been searching for God. I have been yearning for God, but he seems hidden. Seasons of challenge, seasons of difficulty, of despair can often leave us feeling that way. Lord, where are you in all of this? And yet, perhaps still for others, they have found themselves in a season of maybe kind of letting go of God, leaving him maybe on the sidelines, so to speak. There's an E letter that I get each week from a church leader type who is a geek about church leadership and offers insights. And one of the things he's been learning as he's talked to different pastors and congregations across the continent is that church is different after this pandemic. In fact, a lot of people haven't returned to church, perhaps gotten used to watching it on screen or gotten used to not being together with God's people. Maybe there is a sense in which people have, maybe not even intentionally, but just let go of God. And what we find in this psalm is that the poet gives a voice to all. To those in seasons of struggle, we hear the psalmist saying, even the sparrow has found a place, a home, a nest. 
and to those who have found themselves maybe somewhat distant from God. There's beautiful words of invitation in this psalm. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, O Lord. It strikes me that this psalm is inviting us towards something that that I imagine most every person wants. Deep down in the core of our being, don't we all want to experience God himself? An experience that connects our lives with what is ultimate, what is true, what is sure, what is real. The one who brings true peace, true joy, deep-seated joy. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I suspect maybe if the words would be different for different people, there is something in most all people that connect with that cry. And might being together in this place, as we're gathered here this day and each Lord's Day, might this not be today in this gathering what the psalmist is describing? Well, to answer that question, I suppose we might have to answer it yes and no. No, in the sense that this building, as beautiful as it is, is not the New Testament version of the temple in Jerusalem. This is not the temple, so to speak, that the pilgrim in Psalm 84 was thinking about. No, In fact, the Bible teaches us that 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 temple in Jerusalem was really a signpost, a signpost of a temple that was still to come, a temple that was not localized in a geographical place, but a temple that was personalized in a man named Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, destroy that physical temple and I will rebuild it in three days, referring to his work on the cross and his resurrection. Jesus himself was the tabernacle, the temple in whom God dwelled. The writer of Colossians says that in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the temple. He is the temple the sacrifice for sin and the very presence of God, which in the Old Testament was exactly what the temple stood for, the place where sin was atoned for through sacrifice, the place where the presence, the Shekinah of God was encountered. In Jesus, we saw the glory of the one and only. He is the temple. And yet, we find a powerful teaching in the New Testament that those who are joined to Christ, those who are joined to him and become his body, they, write Paul, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 and chapter 6, you, plural, not singular, You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so as God's people gather in a place like this, when Jesus says where two or three are gathered, there I am present with them, there is a very real sense in which this gathering is like pilgrims going to the temple of the Lord. And, you know, this building has some significance, too. It's not just like a movie theater or some other community hall. This is a building that God's people have dedicated for the sake of gathering together to meet the Lord, to encounter him. And so even our church buildings, writes Stan Mast, however humble or grand are the places par excellence where we can find God. He quotes an unnamed spiritual pilgrim. And the quote 
reads like this. I looked for God on the mountain and I found grandeur, but it was not God. I looked for God down by the shore and I found relaxation, but it was not God. I looked for God on the golf course and I found camaraderie, but it was not God. I looked for God in my family home and I found love, but it was not God. I looked for God everywhere and I found many wonderful things, but I could not find God. Then I went to church and there I found God. Though I might say that pilgrim is overstating some things and understating others, the point is clear. God does dwell in a significant way in that place where his body is gathered, for they are the dwelling place of the living God, the temple. And we meet God here in that place. I recall listening to a speaker, and this perhaps is a kind of an analogy, speaker talking about the importance of corporate prayer, God's people coming together to pray, as opposed to simply each of us praying on our own by ourselves in our prayer closets, whatever those are, or in our homes somewhere. And when asked why is corporate prayer so significant, he talked about instances in the Bible where God's people come together and pray, and there does seem to be some sense of, of power in which God responds to those corporate gatherings. But he said, you know, a word that I suspect I would use as I think about the importance of corporate prayer is that it would seem that as God's people come together to pray, there is a, a kind of authority that's present that is different than when we pray simply on our own. And, and my experience of that has been when we pray together, sometimes, and you, I'm sure, experienced it too, you might have something on your heart and you're thinking, Lord, should I contribute this part to our corporate time of prayer together? Maybe it's a prayer for something specific or more general and you're not sure and, and you wait upon the Lord as people are praying and then all of a sudden, somebody else prays it. Prays exactly what you were thinking and you know, okay. And then someone adds to that prayer and then you feel free to add to that prayer and you have this sense that it's the spirit of God who's there with the communal group of people there leading us in prayer and there's a sense of authority that seems to be present I think that is an analogy to why the psalmist longs for the courts of the Lord where God's people are gathered to be together with him We can't help but notice that deep longing that characterizes the psalmist. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And perhaps that phrase gives us pause too. Maybe each one of us as we read that are left to wonder, is that the posture that describes us as we think about coming? to the courts of the Lord each Lord's day? Is this the posture or the frame of mind that we bring with us to this moment, to this gathering, to this space? Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out to meet the living God. A longing for home, a longing for a place near the altar of the Lord. This longing, the psalmist connects with a, a sense of pilgrimage. I realized when I was beginning to work with this text to preach for today, I have never preached on this text in a Sunday service. I've done it more than a dozen times at funerals. It's a text often that families, my mother's funeral too, that families select for me to reflect on in a funeral. And we can understand why. This speaks about 
journeying to that place where the psalmist encounters the presence of the Lord and when one of our loved ones goes to be with the Lord, we believe that they are now in that place encountering that presence where in some sense their life has reached its destination. Their pilgrimage has found its fulfillment and we rejoice and, and we're mindful of our own journeys in moments like a funeral, our own journey of life. And yet, what if even each Sunday we have some sense as we come to a gathering like this that in a small way we are in a preview of what those deceased loved ones now see face to face, the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his splendor. Each Lord's Day is like a preview each seven-day period, we pause for focusing our attention, for finding refreshment and renewal on our pilgrim journey. We pause and have this preview of what one day will be the glorious completion of our journey there in the courts of the Lord with all the saints there at home at last. Each Sunday, we have a preview of that. We see it, we experience it, we sing it, we pray it. We hear the Lord assuring us that we have a home in him. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. I'm sure that it would be almost impossible to imagine every Sunday being one of these kind of mountaintop experiences where the Lord just manifests himself in such glory and such radiance that, that you think and feel and experience what the poet is writing about. I, I don't know if that is realistic. But I dare say, as we bring with us this kind of longing, there are times when we do encounter God with the same kind of passion that the, the poet writes about. I tried to think of services in the past, and of course, a number of them come to mind. But I remember one, and I, sh I share this because the place where we worshiped wasn't even a church building. It was an office tower in the city of Nanjing in China. And so in that sense, it didn't evoke a sense of awe and, and majesty. The building was just a, a white-walled office space on the 20th floor of an office tower in Nanjing. But the night before, I and, and my friend Daniel, we were in China that summer, 2012, and we were meeting with a professor that had spent a year here. A number of you will know him. And uh, we were meeting with him. At that time, he had not found a church to connect with. He had been back in Nanjing for about 10 months. And we met with him that Saturday night, and we were talking about all kinds of things connected to faith and life. And he, at that point, had not been baptized, had not kind of publicly committed his life to Christ, still felt some apprehension about connecting with a church community particularly an unregistered church community, knowing the consequences of that as a member of the Communist Party. We had this wonderful conversation on Saturday night, and he was going to go for the first time to the house church that um, he is now part of, and Daniel and I had the privilege of being there with him that Sunday. And... I carried with me a sense of this anticipation, this longing. Based on all the things we talked about together on Saturday night, I said to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my heart and flesh cry out that, that my friend, this professor, would meet you and encounter you. And as the minister was preaching, again, it was like 50 of us in a, just a built uh, office space. The translator was sitting beside me 
My friend Daniel, who came with me, couldn't hear the translation, so I had to fill him in later. But the translator was sitting beside me, telling me what the sermon, what the preacher was saying. And then I started crying. I started weeping. And why was this? I knew that God heard every word we talked about on Saturday night. Because it was as if the preacher was reciting from the script of questions and concerns that my professor had, our professor friend had. It was as if God was in the room on Saturday night and now through this preacher was speaking truth and speaking emotion into everything that my professor friend had expressed that previous night. And it caught him by surprise too. In fact, afterwards, when we had lunch together, he says, I think that that preacher heard our conversation last night, didn't he? And I said, through the Lord, that's exactly what happened. There are moments when you gather together with God's people and there is an authority. There is a presence of the Lord that this psalmist is inviting us to long for, to seek, to yearn for. There is no place like the courts of the Lord. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in all the fine palaces and the tents of the wicked, a doorkeeper. And that's what I felt like I was that night. I was just talking to a professor like a doorkeeper and all I needed to do was open the door just a little bit. And there as he went to worship that next day, he encountered the living God. Dear friends, this is precisely the longing and the yearning that the psalmist invites us to pray for, to long for. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Perhaps, perhaps this week we might take a piece of red card and in bold black letters, instead of the word passion, we might write, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Tuck that in our Bibles, put it on our mirrors, and ensure that on Saturday night and on Sunday morning, as we come into the presence of the Lord, we read those words and pray, Lord, create in me this longing, this yearning to meet the living God, to delight in the courts of the Lord, and to know you as our strength and our shield. Please, let's join together in prayer. Oh God, as we open our hearts to you in prayer now, as we turn to you, as we seek your face, we thank you for being among us. We thank you for declaring us to be the temple of the living God. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, you have accomplished for us salvation, become for us the sacrifice for our sin, that we might enter clean, washed, that we might delight in your presence. We go back to that story at the beginning imagining for ourselves what are our passions what are the things that ignite our hearts many of them we acknowledge lord our passions you give us good gifts some of them perhaps passions that that occupy too much of our attention our desire this morning as we seek your face is that our principal passion, our foremost desire and longing and yearning would be you, Lord Jesus, to walk with you, to listen to your voice, to know your nearness, and to serve in your name the needs of our world 
to be people who carry with us the love and the goodness, the justice, the grace of the living God. Let this time be a moment each week where we are renewed and refreshed and secured again in that calling. Fill us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord Jesus, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. We want to hear your voice. We want to know your peace. We want to delight in the joy that only you can give. We want to be set free from those things that hold us from you. From sin, from addiction, from temptation. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Because better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.